it's been wonderful to discover more of Jesus' light day by day. And so we're continuing that story today with John uh, chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles handy and ready, uh, we will be going through John 13 verses 1 through 17 this morning. Uh, all of the passages are going to be coming from the New Living Translation, but feel free to follow along with whatever version you are most comfortable with reading, for I know that the Lord will show himself in that. So starting with verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to, prepare, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, and wrapped a towel around his waist and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I am doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter then exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who is bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him, that this is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on the robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that is what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. So what's interesting about John 13 it's kind of a little bit of a sea change, kind of like what the weather that we're going through right now as summertime slowly fades away and gives way to autumn. You could feel a change in the air. You could feel like it's a little bit cooler, it's a little damper. You know, for the last few nights, we've had a lot of fog. And uh, there's definitely a change happening. And that's what we're also seeing here in John chapter 13. It's a bit of a sea change where chapters 1 through 12 follows Jesus' earthly ministry, where Jesus himself is personally involved with the telling of the good news, sometimes one-on-one -on -one interactions like the woman at the well, sometimes small groups, sometimes large crowds like the feeding of the 5,000. But oftentimes it's actually Jesus that is sharing the coming of the kingdom of heaven. But what we see here at John chapter 13 is that Jesus is now telling his disciples, this is now something that you're going to be doing. The gospel is now going to be shared through you and through your actions. And so this is basically where Jesus is saying, this is how you are going to continue his ministry, preparing them to take the things that he has shown them on the three years of this incredible journey that John has shared us for the past 12 chapters. And it's just so incredibly personal because John was there, you know, unlike the other three Gospels that are more like a recounting and an aggregate of different types of information and stories that have been compiled 
from other people, John was actually there. And so we actually get to see a certain intimacy that is continued here in John chapter 13. Because he's showing them for the past three years, this is what you're going to spread. This is the good news. And it will continue to spread even after Jesus' earthly body has gone away. And so why is this passage of feet washing so significant? Because, you know, feet washing was just a commonplace thing. You know, if you think about most people got around on their feet. If you were lucky, maybe you could afford a mule or a horse, but that wasn't really most of everyone. Everyone was wearing sandals. You know, we didn't have anything like these closed-toed shoes that we're so used to wearing nowadays. Footwear was a lot different. And so imagine if you're walking around uh, Galilee for years, you know, days at a time, following Jesus around on his ministry. You're going to have some pretty dirty, achy, tired feet. And so anytime that you arrive at a home, you would often be greeted at the door with a wash basin where you could wash the dirt off. You know, aside from just being hygiene, though, it was a show of hospitality. It was basically saying, come on in, take a load off, and relax. Usually feet washing, though, was performed by someone that was of a lower social stature, either a servant or a slave. Oftentimes, definitely going to be a lower stature than the homeowner, going to be a lower stature than the people visiting. And so what is Jesus demonstrating here? Because Jesus, in this passage, just like in previous passages, he's flipping the script. He's taking societal norms and practices and turning them on their head because he is their Lord, their master, their leader. And yet, instead of having the disciples' feet washed before entering the home, or at least before sitting down for the meal, Jesus interrupts this normal activity to wash their feet at a rather odd time. He takes off his normal clothing and assumes the stature of a household servant, insisting on washing the disciples' feet while they are gathered there at the dinner table. So what point is Jesus making with this? Most likely all of the visitors there that were seated there at the supper table would have already actually washed their feet upon entering the home, definitely before seating down, sitting down for the meal. So why does Jesus insist on washing their feet then at the table? Because Jesus is interrupting their expectations. He's doing this in so many ways. Even though they may feel like that they're clean already, they've come in the home, the servant's already washed and dried their feet uh, during the uh, discussion. Maybe there might have been some essential oils that were put on their feet to soothe some of the achiness that they might have from traveling. So they might feel like that they're already clean outwardly, but Jesus is telling them that maybe something else is happening here, that before the eyes of God, they might not actually be as clean as they think. Because I think that that's kind of like all of us, right? All of us have pretty good hygiene. I didn't smell anything funny when I was walking here in the church this morning. So, you know, all of us, you know, seem to take pretty good care of ourselves. You know, I look around, everyone's very well dressed. Everyone's showered and refreshed for church this morning. And we might think that we're feeling pretty good about things. Got a good job, you know, keep short accounts with people. Not particularly mean, not particularly at least. But then what's happening on the inside? Some of us might actually be carrying around a little bit of dirt that none of us can see. Maybe some of us can't even see the dirt that we're carrying around. I know that as I walk in faith over the last five years of becoming a Christian, there were certain mud tracks, can we say, that I was tracking along with me that I didn't even know about. And that is the kind of thing that Jesus is demonstrating here. Because Jesus sees something else. In the eyes of the Father who reigns in heaven, from a heavenly perspective, 
one might appear clean, clean from the outside. Good hygiene, presentable appearance, clean clothes, a good job, good conduct and disposition. But what's happening on the inside, inside one's mind, inside one's soul and spirit may be, in fact, unclean, soiled, and tainted because all of us fall short of the glory of God. Because even after becoming a follower of Christ, even becoming a fanatic of Christ, like what we were talking about in the previous Wednesdays with friends, we could still be one of his own, but still have a lot of sin in our lives. We can commit our lives to Christ, believe in his salvation of our souls, but you know what? It takes a while, right? It takes a whole lifetime to learn what it means to come under Jesus' lordship and his sovereignty. It's kind of like it takes an entire lifetime to become a citizen of heaven. Because even after being saved, a lot of us still struggle with the same types of challenges that we experienced before we were saved. You know, sinful acts, covetous feelings, lust, addictions, those are all the super obvious ones. But the not-so-obvious ones are like earthly pursuits, things that we pour more energy and devotion into, things that take our eyes off of Christ, take our eyes off of who we love. Because all of these things like money, acquisition of material wealth, property, prestige, high social standings, awards, medals, etc., all of these things look great when it comes to our Western society. We term all of those things as achievement and success. But all of those things can easily take the place of God that we end up sacrificing ourselves, indeed our own lives, within the tabernacle of our own heart. That we're sacrificing ourselves to an unholy thing. But you know what? All of these things, of course, they're forgiven through Christ Jesus because it's all been washed with his blood. His sacrifice has indeed rectified all sin if we call upon him, call upon his forgiveness, and continue the pursuit of cleansing through him. So then, if we're all forgiven, and if all is indeed finished on the cross, then why is it so important that we have to keep pursuing him? Why is it so important that we have to keep our eyes upon Jesus? So I, I kind of look at this example of like, take a really, really hard day that you've had at work. Just kind of have that in the back of your mind. Just like a terrible day that you had at work. Maybe not the most terrible because we probably don't want to think about that one, but like the second most terrible day that you've ever had at work. So you come home, you take your shoes off, right? Because you don't want to be tracking in any mud into your house, right? Take your shoes off, you take a shower, feels great, you're cleaned off. And then imagine on your table the most amazing meal that you've ever, that you could ever imagine, right? Somehow it got there. Maybe your wife or your husband made it for you. Maybe you got like some really awesome roommates and they just made you this like great meal. Uh, maybe like your DoorDash guy like snuck in somehow through the window and just like placed it there and it was just like awesome, right? You're, it's, it's everything that you ever wanted. So you sit down and you have a great meal. You're so satisfied. You're relaxed. You know, you've put on your favorite TV show, you kick up your feet. After you're finally like, you know, feeling um, decluttered from your bad day at work, you know, you get ready for bed and you have a beautiful, uninterrupted and peaceful eight hours of sleep. It's a great, great, great scenario, right? Probably something that doesn't happen to us very often, unfortunately. But imagine that you went through all of those things and then you woke up the next morning and you're like, oh, yeah, that was so good. I, I can't wait to tackle today. It was such a good meal, such a good shower, such a good sleep. I don't want to sleep, 
eat or shower ever again. I'm so satisfied by that. I mean, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, does it? Because that's the way that it is like when we do not pursue God on a daily basis. It's like saying, you know what? Like, I've been forgiven of all of these things. I don't need to think about it anymore. I don't need to think about him anymore. All has been saved. All has been forgiven. It is finished on the cross. And so I'm just going to go ahead and skedaddle about my day. And I will not have to think about any of those things ever again. Because it is finished. But that would be the same thing as like saying that you didn't need to eat ever again. Like you never had to sleep ever again. Never had to shower ever again. Because that is what we are called to do. We're called to seek Jesus daily. We need his forgiveness daily. We need his grace daily. We need his life daily. Because we need to be refreshed by Jesus daily. We need him through the word of God, through prayer, through fellowship with the body of Christ, the church. Through sharing his light, the light of the Lord, that was given to this dark world to be a light in the darkness. And remember that this darkness could never be extinguished. But we're called to share that. Because Jesus has already saved you. You just need a refresher. He's already washed you clean of all of the sins, all of your transgressions that you have done, are doing, and will be doing. But you know what? It's really nice to get a feet washing every day, isn't it? Because even though we have committed our lives to Christ by asking him to not only save us from the death that we deserve as sinners by giving us new life, we still need daily feet washings to remove the dirt that we've tracked into a house made clean by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is kind of like my little sound bite. So if anyone wants to take a picture of that, I'm going to go ahead and leave that up for a little bit. Because you, you know, we all need a little sound bite to share on social media, right? And so what else is happening here in this passage, though? Because Jesus flips the script yet again in another way. He's acting as a servant to his disciples. As stated earlier, feet washing was an activity that was reserved for slaves and servants of the home. However, Jesus shows a new archetype for the kingdom of God. That earthly status means nothing. It is obedience to the Father that matters most. Christ is the Son of God, King of all kings, Lord of lords, just like what Mr. Mike back there said during our uh, Bible study this morning. Lord of lords. Yet here he is in John 13, washing the feet of mere mortals, regular people just like me and you. Because Jesus had come to earth to fulfill the will of his Father. He himself was not saying that I am putting myself at a lower stature than the disciples. That's not what he was saying. He is saying that I am coming completely and totally and wholly under the will of my Father in heaven. And I am instructing you to do the same. Jesus says that if you are want to be one of my fathers, you must be under complete control of the Father. Because Jesus had come to earth to fulfill his Father, God, our Heavenly Father, his will to take the sins of the world and overcome them on the cross. And this meant Jesus enduring torture, beatings, and hardship that we could not imagine. He was not bowing down and washing the disciples' feet, showing that he was in fact lower than them. But he was showing a prototype of the behavior of all of those who call Christ Lord and Savior to follow, to be servants of God our Father and to serve him wholly by serving others, by serving our families, friends, and community, where people around us can look to us to look to where they can go to have their spirit washed through prayer, discipleship, and Christ-centered fellowship. Because Jesus is not calling us to be a doormat where people can wipe their trauma and their hang-ups all over. 
He's calling us to be a guide. He's calling us to be a guide to show where spiritual cleansing, cleansing can be found. And that can only be found through Christ alone. For as Christians, as Christ followers, we are, we are commanded to be a reflection of Jesus Christ. And you know a mirror can only reflect light when it is clean. Because Jesus calls us to serve the Most High God, His Father, our Father. And we can only do that if we follow Him. So another kind of interesting thing, though, that happens in this passage, right? We see that Judas has already been singled out. As uh, Let me reiterate from uh, verse 10. It says, Jesus replied, a person who had bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he, wh what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. So could you imagine the gravity of that situation? Jesus gathered there with his 12, knowing that one of them is going to betray him. And then yet he washes Judas' feet anyway. So that underscores a really important point, is that Jesus saves all, but some will reject his salvation. Because Jesus knew that Judas had been seduced by the devil to betray him. The salvation of Christ had already been offered to all of the disciples, but Judas was one that rejected him. So this brings up an important point. In Judas's selfish aspirations to please the people around him and for material gain, did he in fact say no to salvation, say no to heaven, and say yes to hell? Is there a reality of not going to heaven despite the good news that Jesus Christ offers us? Because this passage states that not all that were seated at the table were clean. Not all had been washed by Jesus' salvation. Judas had rejected in his heart and in his actions. And there have been arguments saying that, Jesus, that Judas had been banished to hell. Some say yes, based on several passages in the Bible. So during my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you have gave me. I guarded them so that not one was lost except for the one that was headed for destruction as the scriptures foretold. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know who... I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. Because I think, you know, it is completely possible for us to reject the Lord. And in turn, the Lord can reject us. Those who do not call Christ their Savior and their Lord will not be saved from the death of sin. Even though Jesus came with a lifeboat, the only way to be saved from the crashing waves is to get in. And if you don't get in, do not be surprised if you sink. Because Jesus came to save all, but not all will accept his salvation. For people, you know what, we're kind of an odd bunch. We like to do things our way. We like to stroke our own ego and say that I've created my life with the brawn of my hands, with the cunning and nimbleness of my mind, I did it my way. But you know, when we live life by our own devices, usually those devices become the vice that gets us trapped. It's the vice that breaks us, that leads us astray, and leads us to destruction. Because Jesus came to save all. And the main question that we have to ask ourselves every day is that do we want to get stuck in the vice? Do we want to sink and drown? Or do we want to be saved? Because the main question is, 
would you let Jesus wash you? Just in the same way that Simon Peter in this passage said, no, Lord, you can't wash my feet. That's an activity that is underneath me. That's an activity that is underneath you. But then if we are all here called to serve our Lord and Father, we must be underneath him in order for us to be cleaned. Because the path that Judas took is not the path that we are going to take. That's not God's will. God, our Heavenly Father, gave us Christ Jesus to save us from our sinful nature and the death that it brings. Christ's blood washes our soiled souls, all the muck that our sins have brought upon us. He washes it white as snow. Because you know what? Like on the journey of life, we sometimes track a lot of mud along with us. Old habits, old patterns, old ways of thinking, old ways of living before we knew who the Lord is. And we need the forgiveness of Jesus to wash our feet. Just like eating, sleeping, taking a bath, brushing and flossing our teeth, spiritual cleaning and feet washing is a daily habit, a daily need, because we need daily forgiveness. We need daily grace. We need daily humbling, because we need to make Christ our Lord and Savior daily. We need to put our sins on the cross and crucify those things daily. We need to put our sinful selves on the cross and crucify that daily. Because that is the only way for our renewed selves can be made alive through Jesus. We need that renewal daily. And so a question for all of you is, would you let Jesus wash you? Would you let him wash your feet? So I'd like to invite the uh, worship team back up here before I wrap up. Thanks for listening to my talk today. <laughs> and I just, you know, wanted to remark with this because a lot of you sitting here in this room have been walking with the Lord for a very long time. Some of you have actually been walking with the Lord since probably the day of your birth, maybe at least since the first time that you could remember that you grew up with the daily waterings that the Holy Spirit gives you, that you got to walk in Jesus' sunshine every single day up until this point. And I just, I admire that. I mean, I would almost like to say I envy that, but envy is not really a fruit of the Spirit, so I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't envy that. Because I myself have only been walking with the Lord for a few years, but you know what? The light of His love is still all the sweet. You know, and some people that might be watching this online, maybe they're not walking with the Lord right now. Or maybe they're kind of wondering what it's like, maybe teetering on the edge a little bit. But just as an encouragement, you know, sometimes when we take our eyes off of Jesus, the road that leads to him, we end up spinning our wheels off of the pavement, right? Sometimes we hear a little bit of a skid and then we get back on again. Or sometimes we end up in a ditch and we're stuck. The wonderful thing about the Lord is that He's kind of like a tow truck that'll get your car out of the mud. He's a little bit like the body shop that's going to fix your car up and make it all brand new again. He's a little bit like the hospital that's going to patch up your scrapes and your bruises and your bumps. But in all reality, he's just so much better than that because he ain't no tow truck. He's better than that because a tow truck you have to wait for. A tow truck just says, could I see your AAA card? And then after he gets your car out of there, he splits. 
And he's not, like a, he's not like a body shop. He's much better than that. Because a body shop will put, old, will put new parts on an old car. And you know what? He's also not like a hospital. He's better than that too. Because all a hospital can do is patch up the stuff that's physically present. And then Jesus heals the parts of you that nobody can see other than him. And the wonderful thing about it is that he heals the parts of us that needs healing the most. And he heals it for all of eternity. And so if you want to say yes to Jesus washing you this morning, let's go ahead and say a prayer together. You could read this along with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to take my sins and wash me completely clean. Please, Lord, forgive me for the sins I have committed. I renounce my sinful nature and nail it to the cross. I am a new creation through you. Even as I fall short of the glory of heaven, please, Lord, wash me and renew me and help me wash the feet of others. I want to be your servant, for you are Lord. I pray this in your name. Amen.